In this video, I'm going to show how to paint this sailboat painting. And in the down bar, I'll share the link to the source for this. This is a photograph that was taken by one of my good friends and he gave me permission to paint it. I'm using ultramarine blue, cerulean. This is Bice by Vasari, burnt sienna, yellow ochre pale, cadmium yellow, and then I have two kinds of white. This is, oh, I'll have to remember what that one's called. This one's titanium white, and that's mostly what I'm gonna reach for. I don't think I use the other white at all. And then in my containers there, I have linseed oil and um, Gamsol solvents. So I already did a painting earlier, which is why I have some paints mixed on my palette. But what I'm mixing up and putting on the linen panel right now is a mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And I mix it with some Gamsol to thin it out. And this is how I tone the majority of my canvases and linen panels or wood panels, whatever I'm painting. So I'm just brushing it on, as you can see, very loosely. And this is just about getting color on the panel. So it's, first of all, so it's, more similar in tone to the color of my palette so that the colors I mix on my palette show up on the panel the same way. And it also, I think it just helps warm me up a little bit. Um, and then also I don't feel like I have to put paint on every single little millimeter of the panel. I can just leave some of the tone showing through and that'll be fine. Whereas you wouldn't want to have like white gesso necessarily showing through. I guess you could, but that's not what I want to do. So I put it all over the panel. The panel I'm using is a linen panel and I'll share a link to that as well. And now I'm going to blot off the excess with a paper towel. And this is so the paint isn't mixing with the new paint I put on. And then I'm going to show you a trick. And if you've done a painting class with me before, you may have seen this trick. I haven't seen anybody else ever do this, so I don't know if I made up this trick or if it's an actual thing, but what I do is I lay the piece of paper over the canvas and then just use the back of my brush handle and trace over it. And I'm not tracing every little fine detail, I'm just tracing the important parts of the composition. And I don't do this with every single painting. I do it when there are a lot of lines or if it's very important for things to be in the right place, like in a portrait, it's really important for the facial features to be in the right place. In this case, I wanted to get the architecture right and I wanted to get the elements of the ship right and to scale. So sometimes I'll just go ahead and work on the drawing, maybe use this method to double check or I'll just measure to double check. But when I just want to get right to painting, I don't want to work on my drafting skills, I just want to paint, then this is what I do to give myself just a really good head start. So it's kind of a little cheat, but it's a nice way, especially if you're scared of drawing or if you just want to hop right into the painting and you don't want to have to spend, you know, an hour, hour and a half tweaking the drawing to make sure it's exactly right. So this is a real place and I wanted to make sure that I got the orientation of the buildings and the ship and all correct. So now I'm coming in with a dagger, an evergreen dagger brush from Rosemary & Co. And it's one of my favorite brushes for drawing out the details of this underpainting. And I'm just painting still in that ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mix but I am, I didn't add quite as much Gamsol, so I let it be a little bit thicker. And I am now working on the values of the painting. So I'm starting with the parts of the painting that are the darkest, and then I'm going to move to, the, from dark to light. So adding paint to the dark areas. And then if I get to any of the lighter areas, I'll use a paper towel. Sometimes I'll use a brush as well, a clean brush, just to pull off the color. But this is, what this is doing is, first of all, it's giving me an opportunity to focus just on 
the values. And if you're not familiar with values, it's what's light and what's dark. So it gives me an opportunity to to identify those things without having to worry about color. If you're trying to deal with color and value together, that can be, it can be tricky. It can be kind of difficult. And if you, if you don't think that's hard, look at something that's multicolored, like an apple is a really good example. An apple that has some red and some green on it. So like maybe a honey crisp apple. Can you tell what the darkest parts of the apple are? What's in shadow? What's in the light? Because you've got the light green playing against the darker red and then the shadows that are falling from the light. So it can be kind of tricky to determine what all of the values are. So when you separate that out, color and value, and just work on the values that it gives you just an opportunity to focus on one thing at a time. And then once you have the values established, you can move on and just focus on color and making sure that you match your colors to the values you established in the underpainting. I think the underpainting is also a great opportunity to make sure that you are happy with the composition of your painting, that if you are drawing it all out, that you're happy with the drawing, so you can see I'm coming in there and kind of pulling a little bit of paint up, my hand's in the way, but pulling a little paint up with a clean brush. I think I'm actually using a rubber brush there to kind of pull a little bit of paint up. There was a little bit of horizon peaking between the sail and the boat or ship, I guess. And so I was trying to pull that back out again. And what I love about the dagger brush is that you can use it sideways the way I am now. So you can cover kind of a broad area quickly. So I'm covering this area that has the grasses and you can also use it as a liner though. So I was able to use it along the roof line. And again, this is just a quick, this isn't fine detail drawing as you can tell. This is just getting the values on the canvas. And if you want the underpainting color to be darker, you can add more ultramarine blue. If you want it to be a little bit more orange, you can add more burnt sienna. And if you, or more brown, you can add burnt sienna. As you can see, I'm kind of playing with the, the blue and the orange here a little bit in the forefront of the grass. I think it'll make the grass a little bit more interesting to have a little bit of a variety of colors underneath. And if you want it to be lighter, of course you can always pull it back with a paper towel or a clean brush, but you can add more Gamsol to thin it down. But I like this mixture to be very inky, just a really like, um, kind of creamy texture. I'm taking a paper towel here and just blotting away the tree line so it's a little bit softer. I don't want that to be, you know, when you look at a tree line, it's, it's not this really hard line. It's soft because you have all these little leaves that are creating a soft edge. So I'm trying to keep that line soft and then blotting out some of the foreground as well, where I felt like it got oh, maybe a little too heavy. And you can really take the underpainting as detailed as you want to. Um, I Sometimes I go very detailed, especially with a portrait. I'll get much more detailed, but with something like this, I just get to a point where I'm happy with the big shapes and the overall value of those big shapes and then I'll just start painting. So you can take it as far as you want to. It can be very simple and basic or it can be a super detailed painting, underpainting. It just depends on you and how much information you want when you start adding color. I just wanted the big shapes there. As you can see, like as I'm adding the door and the window, um, I'm just keeping it really loose. It's like a very general idea of where they're going to be.
And I'm starting to mix the sky color here. I'm ready to get to the color. So I mixed some ultramarine blue with cerulean blue. I don't usually do that. I was just kind of playing around a little bit. Usually ultramarine blue is the only blue I'll have on my palette. Sometimes I'll use Bice as kind of a convenient color for sky and a few other things. But I have been playing around with cerulean blue on my palette. So I kind of mix that in a little bit and I add in a touch of burnt sienna to gray it out. I really love that color combination. You can see I'm going into the cerulean blue a little bit more. And of course, it's all mixed with titanium white to lighten it up. And what I love about oil paints is how you can start laying down a color. And if it's not quite right, you just kind of keep mixing and then, um, you know, lay down that new color. It's, it's just, I find it so forgiving. But one thing when you're working on a sky like this, so there are no clouds, there's nothing super interesting happening in the sky, but I do want to make sure that there is still some variation going on. You don't want the sky to be a solid flat blue. It, that would look very unnatural. You want it to have some variation where there's some lighter spots, some darker spots, or it's darker at the top and then lighter towards the horizon. Um, it's just fun to play with some variation. It makes it look more interesting and a bit more natural. I'm using a, hmm, I'm not sure which brush that is. I think that's a flat ivory that I'm using to lay that down. Probably a size four, but I will double check. I'll make sure I, I link all the brushes here, but I'm not someone who uses a ton of brushes in a painting. I'll usually grab... Um, three or four and then those are what I use for pretty much the whole thing It depends though, on what I'm painting. I'll use more brushes depending on the subject Sometimes I'll use one brush the whole time But I'm sort of working from everybody has their own method for how they start on a painting and do you paint what's furthest back first? Do you paint the most important thing first? Do you paint the largest area first? Do you start at darks and work to lights? Like it, everybody has their own method. I almost always start with the sky because it's the furthest back and then I'll kind of move forward from there. Um, I save a lot of the, the details till the end. I like to get paint kind of all over and then I can start focusing on the details. Other people, they paint one thing at a time. They're very systematic and compartmentalized. I kind of bounce around from thing to thing and adjust depending on how things are relating to one another. So you can see in the sky, I added more white as we got down closer to the horizon. And then I'm kind of mixing it out just very loosely. I, I want to have some spontaneous texture happening in the sky that doesn't look contrived or super intentional. I just want it to be very um, kind of instinctive and organic. And of course then I have to, the trick is though I have to be detailed around the ship so I can work around what I already have laid down. So the trick with painting around things is you have to remember that the sky is one thing. It's not, it doesn't have hard lines around the ship or the horizon. It's, it's behind it. So you always want to just look at that with a little bit of extra care to make sure that the sky doesn't look like it's painted around. Like maybe sometimes the color can be different around objects. Like uh, you can see somebody mixed it a little bit more white and then you've kind of created this halo around the item, which sometimes you want to do that. That can happen, like kind of that illusion that something's glowing. But in the case of this ship, I want to make sure that the sky behind it looks like one thing and not like a bunch of brush strokes around the ship. So I'm working in carefully and then you can see I'll kind of pull the paint out a little bit more to prevent it from looking like the ship's painted in into the sky. I 
I like how the lighter blue is kind of feathered into some darker blue. So it does, even though there aren't clouds in this picture or in this painting specifically, it does give some, it, it gives a feeling of clouds or some atmosphere, maybe way off in the distance that aren't really defined. And I do like that look. So I'm mixing up, it's really the same colors, just in a different ratio for the water. The water in the painting is a pretty intense blue. And so I wanted to try to capture that. Again, I'm working kind of close around the ship here, being careful. I'll eventually move to a smaller brush, but I want to try to have a bigger, <laughs> bigger brush as long as I can so I can cover more area. And I'm trying to pay attention to where's the water darkest and where is it lightest? Does it get lighter to the towards the horizon or darker? Where are things reflecting off of the water? trying to pay attention to all of that as I'm mixing the color and brushing it on. There's not a strong reflection of the boat on the water, but there is a little bit of the white sail reflected off of the water. So I wanted to try to capture that, just that lighter area.
Okay, I'm now mixing up kind of a brownish gray to start on the, I think these are little fish shacks. <laughs> so this was taken from my friend's house. I have some friends who live in Nova Scotia on the water and they see this the sailboat is called the Blue Nose 2, and they see that sailing by their house quite often. And these little fish shacks are kind of off their front yard. Such a cute little town and place to live, beautiful place. I hope to visit there someday. But since they're right on the water and <laughs> always getting good pictures. I'm like, can I use them? I'm not on the water very much. <laughs> I live in Minnesota, so I don't get to go to the beach very often. So what I'm looking at with these two sheds or shacks is that I'm trying to pay close attention to what's lighter, what's darker, pay attention to how much detail I want to add. It's easy with buildings to get caught in the detail. And these are not the main point of the painting. These are an accent to the painting. So I don't wanna get caught up too much in drawing every little shingle or every little detail of the door and the hardware and everything. So what I'm trying to do is just capture the, I guess the loose visual interpretation of those items. So I wanna show the roof has texture and variation without having to draw it all out. And I also need to, through the values, show well which shed is ahead of the other one, where are the shadows falling to give the shape some form because ultimately a house it's it's a shape it's a rectangle with a triangle on top and then other rectangles within sometimes circles and things but what we're dealing with here are just rectangles and triangles so I want to give those three-dimensional form and you do that through showing where the light and the shadows are falling and so that's what I'm paying attention to here the shadow that's falling from the roof line and how dark that is versus where the light is falling. So I'm working dark to light at this point. And all of these are painted just in tones of brown. And I'm primarily again using burnt sienna and ultramarine, ultramarine blue. And then I'm mixing in a little bit of yellow ochre when I want it to kind of be more of a beige brown. And um, then I'm mixing in titanium white to lighten it up. So it's the same colors that I just start to, to tweak and mix at different ratios. And what's so cool is this whole painting up to this point has really been done primarily with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna with some cerulean added and a little bit of yellow ochre pale added. But it, it hasn't been this wide range of color yet we're getting, you know, we have the sky and the water and now these sheds. So we're getting a good variety of objects painted with a very limited color palette. Do you see how right away adding that darker roof behind, uh, well, on that back building immediately made the one in front of it kind of pop out a little bit more?
Okay, I'm mixing into some piles that I already had, and again, from doing another painting, and I'm going to start shaping out the doorway here a bit more, and the window. I had just, in the underpainting, sort of put little blobs generally where they were going to be, and that was really enough. I just didn't need to get super detailed. And I'm coming in and adding this white paint on the where the light is hitting on the shed and the thing that you want to be really careful about with whites is to not get too light too quickly it's better to stay a little bit darker and keep adding a little bit more white in there because you want to save your brightest white for your brightest highlight and I know for myself when I first started painting that was a mistake <laughs> that I made a lot is I went like straight for the bright white paint and you really don't want to use bright white until you get to the very, very end. So what I have mixed up is something that's, you know, it's kind of a dingy beige. It's, it's some uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue mixed with a lot of white with then some yellow ochre to warm it up. And it's kind of this almost a light mid-tone white. It's not quite you know, it's not a bright white. And, but what it is still doing against the darker colors is it's making, it's giving the illusion of light hitting it, hitting this little shed here, but the shed isn't completely white. So that's what I'm adding in now.
I'm happy with the detail on the sheds now, so I'm going to move on to the ship. And I'm first adding a little bit more dark kind of waves in the water because I can see that in the photo. Again, I don't want to get too caught up in detail because uh, the water is not the main point of the photo either, but I do want it to just like the sky, have variation. So you can see places where the light's reflecting, places where there's shadow, that the water is moving and has texture. It's not still water. So through variation of color and brush strokes, I'm trying to show that. One tip when you're painting water too, and I didn't do this for this painting, and I really wish I had, is it is worth taking a straight edge, like a T-square, and hanging it off the end of your painting before you start painting and draw your horizon line using a straight, you know, using that ruler that's on the T-square. Um, the reason why you wanna do that is because a horizon is perfectly straight. You can, well, a horizon on the water is perfectly straight. You can get away with a crooked horizon when you're painting trees and mountains and all of that because the horizon line is not straight. But the horizon line is straight when you're painting water. So it's worth bringing the T-square out and <laughs> making sure you get that line really straight. Mine is not 100% straight. So I wish I had um, gone back and just 
really made that nice and crisp. So I'm painting the sails and again, here's the temptation to get too light too quickly because we know in our heads, sails are white. It's sort of like when you paint clouds, you think, well, clouds are white. So everybody goes for the white paint when they're painting a cloud. But when you start to paint more and really start to appreciate the variation of color that's found in things that are white, you start to see like very few things are really truly bright white. They're usually a gray white or a yellow white. Um, there, there's always these things, t I guess what I'm saying is things tend to be darker than we think they are. And so with these sails, looking at it in relation to the sky, they actually were um, in shadow. So they ended up looking like a dark blue gray with just some white highlights where the sun was hitting the sails. So it looks a little odd and it takes some getting used to when you're painting these things that your brain says, these are white, why are you painting it this color? It takes a little practice to get used to that. To really look, so much of painting and drawing is about observation. And I'll tell you, since I have started painting, I really notice things so much more. I notice how light falls across things. I notice values and colors more than I ever did. It really helps you to I think notice and appreciate the world around you a lot more. Which couldn't we all use that? <laughs> Appreciating the world around us a little bit more. So I did move to a smaller brush here. I'm working with a flat ivory. It's a size one. I use a size one and zero a lot for little things. And I want my lines here to be pretty straight. They're pretty precise. And an ivory will hold a nice shape. It, they're synthetic bristles. And it's going to hold a really nice shape. I use mine all the time. And they haven't had, you know, crazy bristles sticking out or anything. They keep a nice shape, which is important when you're trying to create nice clean lines. And then I'll go to a hog's bristle, hog's bristle brush or something like a chunking brush. I'll go to those um, when I'm doing like the grasses and trees and things, cause those can be a bit more like fluffy and wild. So I do play with synthetic and natural bristle brushes and kind of play with different textures. I think up to this point, I did use a natural bristle brush for the underpainting, but uh, for the rest of it, I've been using ivory flats or that evergreen dagger that I was using for the drawing. Things that are man-made tend to have very, you know, straight lines, so the synthetic brushes work really well for that. And then for natural items, they tend, you know, they don't have straight lines, so I like to use the natural bristle brushes for those. But that's just me. You can you just have to play around with that. I think we always want to know, like, what brushes are you using? Because I want to use that same exact brush. But brushes are such a personal taste thing. Like, how hard or soft do you like them? How long do you like the bristles? What shapes do you like? So it's such a personal thing that I, I can tell you all the brushes I have, and you can go out and buy all of them. But you're going to end up liking a different set of brushes than I do. You're going to have different go-to brushes. So... I would suggest starting with a few and see what you like and then maybe buy some more that are in that vein and add to it. Because I'll tell you what, I have a ton of brushes. I don't know if it's in the thousands, probably not, but in the hundreds of brushes. And um, there are a few that I love and go to all the time and then the rest are kind of there in case I need them or want them.
So I wanted to keep that back row of trees uh, a little lighter than it actually was in the photo. And so it, it has that sense of atmosphere that there's air between the point of view and those trees. And also so that the ship comes out ahead of them a little bit more. Definitely a part of painting is all about creating that illusion of depth. So always thinking about that, creating that atmosphere, creating that distance is important. So things up close, these grasses are gonna go darker. So I've gone, I'm back to my ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mixture and um, I'm adding in, I wasn't sure in the beginning if I was gonna add in this little, there's kind of a little path and there are what looks like the remnants of maybe a, I wanna say a dock, but it's not like right on the water. So I'm not sure what it is, but there's some remnants of some sort of a structure. And I wasn't going to paint those in, but I decided I, I did want some sort of interest in that foreground. So I'm adding in a little bit of that structure and some texture from the grasses. And if you followed my painting journey in the very beginning, so probably about four years ago when I started doing oil painting, I was absolutely terrified of foreground. I thought it was like the hardest thing, the worst thing to paint. And it was just the detail and like how much detail do you add? And I just didn't know what to do with foreground. And I've gotten much better with it. And I think when there are things that you're sort of scared of or you find that you're shying away from it you just need to make yourself paint it over and over and over again and um, painting still life I think really helped me with my foreground too because I worked more on detail and observation and I think it also helped me to play around with ideas like I don't I don't have to put a lot of detail. It's okay if it's a hint of something and just kind of learning to, to relax into it and not get too uptight about it. It helps me also with foreground to do sort of this, you can see I'm kind of washing in color. I'm trying to create some texture and a little variation in the tone and the values. And getting that laid down kind of helps me okay, the, the foreground is covered. Like I could almost leave it here. Like it feels a little unfinished to me, but I could almost leave it right there and, um, and that would be fine. So I think just dealing with the larger shapes can really help with foreground initially. And then I do come in and add a lot more texture. I wanna try to capture where the light is hitting and this light on this day it wasn't this bright sunny day it was very diffused light that was a little bit softer so it was a little harder to capture like I didn't have super dark shadows or super bright highlights but I did want to capture some light that was falling and on the path on the flat surfaces also on the surface of the shack there so that's kind of what I'm working through now is adding some variation in the shadows and highlights. And I'm working with a small natural bristle brush here, so it's all a little scruffier.
So I'm coming to the end here of this painting. So I'm just going through and now is where, even though I'm working with my lightest highlights, I'm still not working with a super bright white. It's still kind of an off white. And I'm just adding where I see the brightest parts of the photo, where the light is hitting, where things are light in color, like some little rocks that are catching the light, the remnants of that structure where the wood was capturing the light. And then just kind of looking at the overall painting and is there anything that needs to be tweaked or adjusted before I call it done. This is, this is a good time. Well, you should always just take a few breaks and step back from your painting to see like, okay, how's it looking? How does everything look in relation to each other? Because sometimes when you're really fixated on, okay, I'm working on the ship right now, you kind of lose track of the context of it and the overall painting. So um, it helps to kind of go back and see like, okay, working on the water again, where do I want to have the highlights? You can see I'm adding in kind of more of a blue green in there just some more variation. So this is the point where I do just kind of my tweaking. And th this stage, oh my gosh, it could last forever if you don't just put a limit on it and say, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna be done. <laughs> and I'm just coming in at the end here to add a little Canadian flag off the end. I noticed in the picture that there was a little one flying from that large sail. So um, I don't have a red on my palette. So I was just mixing up a burnt sienna with a little bit of the ultramarine blue. And then I'm using just kind of that off white mixture as the white in the flag. You could certainly pull a red out in the palette, definitely, but I was just using what I had on hand. And it's interesting how the burnt sienna can read as a red, uh, even though it's the one I'm using specifically is a little bit more orange, but it can read as a, as a red. Just adding a bit more shadow around the front. I felt like I had kind of lost a little bit and I'm adding um, some more burnt sienna as well just to add some warmth and a little bit of color down there. I tend to paint very cool and I have to kind of make myself go back and add some warmer colors in there because it really does then make those cool colors sing even more. So I'm adding in some uh, pretty pure burnt sienna there just to add some warmth. And that's pretty much it. I'm gonna let the painting dry for about a week and then finish it off with some Gamvar gloss varnish. And that painting is done. Mm -hmm.